We talked about this as Jesus praying, and, and I, I, I think one of, the, one of the takeaways that I initially had was that we need to be intentional about how we pray. We tend to pray in a pattern that we have learned in an early part of our lives. Whether it's listening to your parents pray at the dinner table, you might say the same prayers they said at the dinner table. You may have a, 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 a rote uh, dinner prayer. I don't know. Some do, some don't. I grew up in a Baptist church, and a lot of the laymen led in prayer, and we had prayer meetings, and the men were praying. And, and there were certain guys that you, you liked listening to, and they had catchphrases you kind of latched onto as a kid. And I can remember all this junior high boys getting together when one of the uh, deacons would, would pray with us, and, and he'd have us go around and pray, you know, out loud. And we'd repeat a lot of the phrases that he used because that made us, you know, spiritual. Um, and we didn't even know what some of them meant. You know, you, you, you use church language without even a, a comprehension of what you're actually saying. And it wasn't until I was probably in college that I began to reexamine prayer, especially audible prayer in the presence of other people, and think about what do I really, who am I really talking to? Am I talking to the other people? Or am I talking to God in the presence of other people? There's a fine distinction there, by the way. And so when I looked at Jesus' example of prayer, I've got to believe that this was something that he prayed out loud in the presence of his disciples. You know, as we look back on what's happened in the previous chapters, uh, in chapter 14, 15, and 16, Jesus was spending some time with his disciples, bringing them up to speed on what was going to happen. He was telling them, you know, this is a certain phase in my ministry that you guys need to be aware of. And that discussion is continuing as they have gathered together for that Last Supper, but, but he hasn't quite got to the Garden of Gethsemane yet. He's probably walking and talking. With, I love to picture Jesus walking and talking with his disciples. I think, for me, that, that's a way of really communicating when you're with someone. If you're, if you're just strolling along and you can carry on a conversation, sometimes the most fruitful conversations come from that situation. I don't know, maybe it stimulates blood to your brain or something and you talk better. But it seems like we're more open to listening to what other people are saying too as well. And, and as, he is, as he left, because the Bible says that they had left that room, but there's a lot of discussion that continues to go on after that before he actually get to the garden. And so I think as they were walking along, it struck Jesus that the disciples needed to hear him approach his heavenly father so that they would grow in their understanding about prayer because our life in his name will revolve around our prayer life. If your prayer life is weak, you are weak. If we don't understand how prayer affects the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we're not going to be the kind of victorious Christians that we need to be. Our prayer life has to be so intentional that we emulate Jesus Christ and follow his example. And really, this prayer is divided into three parts, real easy to identify. Um, and I've listed these as his focus, his friends, and his vision. Because in this passage, those are the three divisions that I saw taking place. In verses 1 through 5, it begins with Jesus sharing with his heavenly Father, what his focus is. And it tells us in the very first verse, after this, after he got done talking with his disciples, he looked toward heaven and prayed. And I think that was him shifting gears. Even if he was walking along with his disciples, it's almost as if Jesus was walking along and he goes, Father, and right away they knew he was conversing with his heavenly Father. I love that picture. We don't do that very much, do we? We're talk, walking along talking with people and say, why don't I just pray with you while we're walking along here? You know, Father... Watch over this person, you know. Help them realize the presence that, that, that they have with you. Jesus did things so naturally that if you take nothing else away from what it means to have life in his name, know this, that every part of your everyday commonplace life is integrated into your life with Jesus Christ. And that that's where life in his name happens. Day to day, at home, at work, at the school, life in his name. Jesus showed that to his disciples, and his spontaneity about prayer in this passage simply, simply re-emphasizes that. And he starts out in that first verse, after it says, you know, they looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. That is a profound 
sentence when he says the hour has come. In chapter 2, in verse 4, I believe it is, if you remember way back then, when Jesus was sharing with his, with his uh, disciples a, a, a party at a wedding feast, and his mother said, you know, told the, the servants, because they were out of wine, and she said, you know, hey, do whatever he tells you, and, and you know, they're out of wine, she tells Jesus, and Jesus says, you know what, woman, the hour, my hour is not yet come. I love that. And he repeats that phrase through the Gospel of John because Jesus was focused on the plan that God had for him. Now, one of the commentators I read said that this announcement enhances the significance of this prayer because it becomes Jesus' evaluation of the purpose of his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. So this life is, this prayer shows Jesus' focus. And again, the reason I say that is because I want Jesus' focus to become your focus. If we are truly living a life that reflects the life of Jesus Christ, that means we are intentional, even as we begin to pray on what our focus is. We don't always do that. You know, sometimes our focus is I want to sound good with the other people I'm sitting with so they won't think I'm a bumbling spiritual idiot. And I want to say the right phrases so they think I'm spiritual. But our focus should not be there. Even in our quiet time prayers alone with the Lord, what is your focus? What you're worried about? Who hurt your feelings? Or is it God-oriented? You see, that's, that's what's needed, a focus and so Jesus' focus right then was that he understood that now his hour had come. You know, the other verses in, in chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 8, uh, all had to do with him saying, my time has not yet come. But now my time has come. He understands that God is going to be glorified. And that's a loaded phrase for Jesus. And that should be a loaded phrase for us. How does God receive glory in your life? When everything turns out smooth and you're comfortable? Or when you're going through the ringer? What did Jesus have to look forward to? When he said the hour has come, do you realize what he's accepting from God? That's his, that's his mission. And he knows it's not just putting up with somebody. He's actually going to give his life. But he's not just going to give his life. He's going to suffer before he passes away. He's going to be ridiculed. He's going to be beat up. And in all of those things, Jesus is willing to say, you know, the hour has come, and I am ready to focus my attention on fulfilling what that involves. And in verses 2 through 3, he mentions the fact of his focus also being on eternal life, because he mentions that, for you granted... You've granted him, that is Jesus, authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Jesus understood that the gift of God is eternal life, that he was an agent of that, you could say, as God's son delivering that gift to humanity. That's what the hour was all about. You see, eternal life was out of the reach of humanity on their own. They needed intervention from God. And Jesus said, you know, thank you, God, that you gave me the authority to give eternal life to those you have given me. And realizing that knowing God is the key to that eternal life. An intimate relationship. In those passages where he mentions knowing him, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That idea of knowledge is intimate knowledge. Not book knowledge, not knowing that Jesus is mentioned in the Bible, but a relationship with God that is knowing him. In Philippians 3.8, the Apostle Paul said the same thing when he said, What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. So to know God is eternal life, but to know God is a life-changing reality in how you live. You can't have your cake and eat it too, spiritually. You can't be 
mainstream, culturally affirming, and be a vibrant Christian. It takes a countercultural focus to understand that God's message of salvation and eternal life transcends societal norms all over the world. It's a universal truth. It's not an American truth. And we have to be willing to realize the significance of eternal life. And the third thing I saw in his focus was God's glory. He's always saying that. He wanted to glorify the Father. He said it right from the very beginning of his ministry. And in verses 4 and 5, it repeats that same goal. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Our prayers ought to revolve around that same thing, God's glory. When we're facing a tough time, how can God be glorified in it? Is God glorified in it when everything works out smooth? Sometimes. But sometimes God's glorified when the way is rough. You know, there's an old song, he, he gives more grace as the burdens grow greater. That God wants us to realize that his glory should be our ultimate focus in how we live, but how we talk to him. When you pray, do you remember that? Okay, God, this is all about you. Now, glorify yourself. Now, sometimes God's glory means I need to reassess my own relationship with God in the context of that particular situation and realize that maybe I'm trying too hard to glorify myself. And I've forgotten about God's glory. Maybe I want things to work out the way I have planned because some people are control freaks and like to establish everything way at a time and have it all work out according to their plans. And I go, ooh, 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 that's me. And I have to say, God, it's your glory we're after. So his focus had to do with the hour and eternal life and God's glory. Secondly, when he prayed this prayer, it was sort of for his friends, his disciples. I labeled them as friends because I want us to think of ourselves as friends following Jesus. And his disciples were also his friends. He even said, I want to call you friends from now on. So in this passage, he remembers his friends. And he talks about, in verses 6 through 8, God's gifts to those. First of all, he talks about those who were given to him. I'm praying for those you gave me. I, what a great delight to realize that God is in the business of delivering people to Jesus Christ. I'm not. I can preach the word. I can share what the Bible teaches, but it's God that does the gifting. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we forget that sometimes. We beat ourselves up sometimes thinking, how can I convince this person? How can I change this person's mind? You don't need to do that. You need to be a willing servant who is focused in their prayer life on those around you as God's gift. Those that received God's gift, we ought to be thanking Him for all the time. That's why we put a list of church people on the back of the bulletin so you can thank God for them. That God has given them to the church and to you. But he mentions God's, the knowledge of God as the source of that. That, that, that. that once we understand what God is doing, um, it can lead us to knowledge of God. And that knowledge of God leads us further on into belief, which is based on the acceptance of the words that Jesus gave. And if God then is working all those things together as his gift, the people that are involved, the knowledge that's involved, and the belief, all are God's gifts. Now, to me, that's an important truth to influence how you pray. It isn't about you. Except from the fact that you got to get out of God's way. That's how we need to pray. Lord, 
your glory is what we're after. Your will is what you are. Your gifts are what I'm praying about. And these gifted people around me, I, and it changes your perspective, too, of the church. Who, who are these people sitting next to me in church? They're all God's gift and have been gifted with eternal life. You, it, it, there, it, there is something interesting. If someone picks five people and gives them all a million dollars, they're going to think, wow, this is pretty cool, right? And we've all got that in common. What are we going to do with this wonderful gift that this person gave us? He gave us each a million dollars. That's the way we as God's people ought to be joining together on Sundays when we gather to realize the profound gifts that we share. That, yeah, I'm born again, you're born again. What a great gift. God did it all. We didn't do any of it. We're, none of us deserves it. We're terrible people. We're rotten to the core. We deserve eternity in hell, but God picked us up out of that and gifted us with eternal life. And you've got, I've got, what a great thing. Suddenly, the little squabbles really seem insignificant in light of the fact that we share eternity. And so we see God's gifts, but we also see the significance in verses 9 through 12 of God's possessions. All right? And part of the possessions of God revolves even around prayer. And he says in verse 9, I pray for them. All right? He's talking about his disciples. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. How do you pray? Does it sound heartless to say we're not praying for the world? Kind of does, doesn't it? Kind of hits us wrong. It's me wrong sometimes. I should have pity on the world and what's going on. But when Jesus prayed, he said, I'm not praying for the world. The exclusive right to intercessory prayer belongs to those that belong to God. That's where our prayers need to be. We need to, like Jesus, understand that God has possessions that he has claimed for himself and that God's glory, he goes on further, is revealed in them. So if we realize that God's glory is revealed in our fellow believers, how ought we to be praying for our fellow believers when they wander away, when they succumb? to the pettiness that exists in life's experiences. How should we pray? Is God getting glorified in that? Or should we pray that God's glory is revealed and that they're brought back to him so that others can see God in that person's life? God's glory is what's at stake. And as God's possession, his purpose and Jesus' purpose was that he protected those God had given him. And he's referring to his I protected them, and I want them to be one. I want them to be unified and recognize that they are part of God's possession and that they can be part of what God is doing in the world. Now, he mentions that none has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that Scripture would be fulfilled. And it's an interesting side note that he makes, isn't it, that among those who claimed to be Jesus' followers, there was a Judas. But Judas was part of God's plan. So that even as we see the betrayer, we realize that it was a necessary component in Jesus' mind, especially as he's praying to his heavenly father. I don't hate him. I don't hate him. He's part of the plan. That's hard to do when you've been betrayed by someone who is close to you. Very hard to do. To acknowledge that that person doing that to you was probably part of God's plan. Ooh, Uh, I want to hate them because I'm human. I want to resent them. I want to hold on to it. I want to get bitter about it. I want to never see them again. All of those things. And in essence, Jesus is reminding us, don't go there. Because this is all part of God's plan in your life. He's got a purpose for what he's doing. He's got a plan that he is is enacting. And in verses 13 through 19, he talks about God's joy in all of this. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. The things he was saying to them then, he said he expected that that would bring them joy. (laughs) What's he telling them? I'm going to die. 
Woohoo! You should be joyful, right? No, that's not the way we naturally feel. God's joy was something that would be provided as they came to an understanding of the Word of God and saw that this would bring them joy because it is the fulfillment of Jesus' whole mission in life. So our joy standard has to change. Our happy dance needs to be reserved for some of the times that God works in our lives in ways contrary to what we might appreciate. And like verses 13 and 14, to realize that the full measure of God's joy in His disciples would be a result of the things that were going to be happening to Jesus when He said, I am coming to you now. Because you know what else that involved for the disciples? Jesus not being there anymore. And he says in verses 16, 15 and 16, that not only would God's joy in the word that would provide them with joy, but in the, the status that they would share. And what's the status that they shared? Outsiders, aliens, refugees, as it were. They were the aliens of their day because they were not part of the world. And he mentions the fact that, that in verse 15 and 16 by reminding himself and his listeners, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. So we realize that part of our lot in life is to simply accept the fact that we're the oddballs. We're the outsiders. You see, Christians get into trouble when we want to cling to our Christianity and be insiders. I want to be like everybody else. I want to be better than everybody else. I want to, be, I want to, I want to fit in with my society. And we all do this. Let me just tell you that. It's very insidious and very hard to fight. When I look at the, the words of Jesus to people that were saying things like, you know, what do I got to do to enter the kingdom and the kind of things he told them to do, I struggle a little bit with my own Willingness to surrender my life completely. Would you give up everything you have, sell it all, give to the poor, and then follow Jesus with no guarantees? It's a tough one, yeah. Convicted every time I read that. And God wants us to realize that God's joy is in us embracing the Word so that we can experience God and accepting the fact that we're not of the world, we are outsiders, we're going to be different, we might as well accept the fact that we're going to be different, and that Jesus' desire for them was not that they got taken out of the world, and we'll cover that, cover that a little bit later, but He wants them to be sanctified. That's a great Bible word, sanctification. I don't believe sanctification is a one-time event. You reach a certain point of spiritual development, all of a sudden you're sanctified. All right? Now, there are groups of Christians that believe you have an experience that is your sanctification. I call it your dedication or your commitment to God. But sanctification to me is an ongoing process. I don't know about you, but I need it every day. Because sanctified means to be set apart. Now, if I don't intentionally approach the throne of grace... And remind God that my desire is to be set apart. I find myself getting sucked back into a pattern of life that revolves around my desires and my perceived needs. So God wants us to accept the fact and be sanctified. And he mentions it's interesting because he says sanctify them. Uh, as you have sent me, I've sent them. And then they are sanctified by your word. This is the process of becoming like Christ. Sanctify is begun when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. But I believe it's responding to God in obedience. Jesus said, I was sent, I'm sending them. That's response and obedience to what God says. As we respond to God in obedience, we further the sanctification process, right? We're being set apart more and more because we're learning to follow God. You've got to start somewhere in sanctification, I think we as believers need to remind ourselves that we want to honor Jesus' prayer by allowing God to sanctify us. So we need to ask God, set us apart, 
Give us something to do so that we can do it in a self-sacrificial way. That means giving up time or energy or money so that God can continue the sanctifying process. Christians get stalled out in the process a lot of times. We look back on our life and we go, well, yeah, I was really living for the Lord then. Well, what happened? We need to continue the process. So, it tells us in Romans 15, 16, this is the Apostle Paul writing, He gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. That's the great thing about sanctification. The Holy Spirit does it. We willingly accept it, but the Holy Spirit does the work. And then in verses 20 through 26, Jesus' prayer reflects not just his focus and, his, and, and the fact of his friends, but also his vision. And vision is an important thing for a church. And it's a word that gets thrown around a lot. People think if you come up with a catchy vision statement, then the church has a vision. But each of us has to have that same vision. We have to have the vision that Jesus had. What was Jesus' vision? At the point where he said, the hour has come, all right? He knows now what's coming up in the next few days. He knows it's going to involve being falsely accused. It's going to involve, you know, the betrayal that's already happened. It's going to involve pain. It's going to involve sadness. It's going to involve ultimately death. And at the point where he's saying that, he has a vision about what God is doing. Christians... We are too reactive. We react to our circumstances. We're not proactive enough. Proactive means you anticipate the kinds of things that are going to happen in life, and you are prepared. Jesus had been living his whole earthly life knowing that this was his whole reason for living. You have a reason for living as well. Whether you are what we would consider nominal in your faith or church attendance or whether you're super active, the fact of the matter is we need to have a vision for what God wants to do. And Jesus' vision began in verse 20 with a future orientation. All right? The, some, of the, some of the definitions of vision include the ability to think about or plan the future with imagination or wisdom. Do you think about your Christian life that way? Get a church board together, and I did this when I came here. <laughs> I asked them what their five-year goals were, and silence descended. This was a telephone conference we were on, and there were like 15 people, I think, in the room. And they were, I was asking them questions, you know, is there a parsonage? Yeah. Does the parsonage have a backyard? No. <laughs> How close to the church is a part? You know, the, I, anyway, and in the co course of that, I said, oh, by the way, what are your goals for five years from now? Why don't churches think that way? Is that wrong to set goals? But it's very hard for a group of people to get together and do that unless, like Jesus, our focus is correctly on God. So that our prayers reflect that focus and the significance of, of one another and a vision that isn't just about the now. Outcome-based thinking is what I'm talking about. Outcome-based thinking. The decisions you make today have an outcome later. I always use the illustration of planting a tree. When's the best time to plant a tree? Ten years ago. Right? Right? And, and God so blessed me with the fact that there, were, uh, there was a tree that needed to come down in the parsonage front yard. And, and by the grace of God, the church agreed to buy one and someone else in the church paid for another one. And I planted two trees in my front yard because I said to myself, I'm going to get it done as quick as I can. And here it is 10 years later. And you know what I enjoy? That's right. Shade trees. Grown up trees. But that's not a matter of luck. And it's not a matter of luck whether you develop spiritually or not. That isn't just, oh, somebody's lucky, they're spiritually minded. No, that takes being outcome-based in the way you think and the way you pray. Father, this is where I think you're leading me. 
as I go there, I want to see this happen. Don't you think God would be delighted in that? Like a child coming to their father and saying, you know, I want to do this, and then I want to become an independent adult making good decisions. Parent would go, oh, I don't like that. No, I wouldn't do that. God wants you to be that way. Jesus expected the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the disciples to result in adding more believers to their number. So his prayer includes all believers in all ages. He said, I'm not just praying for these guys, but the ones that will come to you because of their message. You know who he's praying for? You. This passage is Jesus praying for you. Because we are here today claiming the name of Jesus Christ because of the witness of the disciples. So Jesus said, I want to focus on the future. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. And what's he start out by saying? Unity prioritized. In verses 21 through 23. You know, in chapter 15, he talked about a vine and branches. Talk about remain in me and my word and you, and you'll bear much fruit. If you remain, if you remain, if we remain together. Unity in the Bible is an indisputable fact that it's a priority to God because of the unity exemplified by the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I want that unity to exist among future followers of Jesus Christ. And, and, and uh, I don't know how well that's panned out. Because we splinter. Not just in denominations, not just in local churches, but even within churches we splinter. Unity isn't the characteristic that the world sees in most churches. They see a tenuous peace where things could blow up at any minute. And you know why they see that? Because they have seen it, the world has seen it over and over and over again in local churches. Things are going good for a while. Just wait. Wait for it. Just wait. Watch. Somebody will get mad. Somebody will be upset. They're going to splinter. And pretty soon, we'll have a new church in town. And then that'll happen again. And it'll happen again. That's the American story. Drive around Nashville, Tennessee. You want to see a lot of churches? Nashville. A lot of churches in Nashville. There's a lot of churches everywhere. Unity isn't something we value even in local congregations. We might say we do, but we don't go out of our way to maintain it. But unity was what Jesus prioritized. And he wanted the unity to resemble the Trinity. And he said that when that happens, God's glory in us is this unity. When you find God gifting you to get along with the people you don't necessarily like, that glorifies God. Not you laying down the law and walking away, but humbling yourself, submitting to God's will, and realizing the joy that God feels. His glory is exemplified in us. Psalm 133, verse 1. I wanted to get a verse from the Old Testament because it reflects the same principle. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. What a good and pleasant thing it is. Let's be united. Wow, newsflash. Let's like sitting together. Let's like meeting together. Let's jump at the occasions when maybe we can gather for a fellowship meal. And spend time getting to know each other. And let's aim for people we haven't met yet and get to know them. Because there's joy in God's heart when his church is unified and we bring glory to God. And that's what Jesus was praying for his future believers. He says, then, then, in verse 23, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Wow. Does the world know that God was, that Jesus was sent by God? If they don't, whose fault is it? You see that 
prioritizing of Jesus' vision centered around, in verses 24 and 20 through 26, love. That's how unity is achieved. Love sounds simple. We say it all the time. Love. Grew up in the hippie generation. Love was a different word then. And it took on a lot of different meanings to a lot of different people. And unfortunately, the word has gotten watered down in American society. We don't know what anybody's talking about when they talk about loving something. I love my dog. I love peanut butter. I love Jesus Christ. Is that all the same thing? I love my brothers in Christ. I love springtime. I love the color blue. So someone says, what is love? What is love? We only have the biblical word agape. That is an unconditional acceptance of another person. It has nothing to do with flowers and trees. It has nothing to do with the food you like. It has to do with being willing to accept a person as they are because of your faith in Jesus Christ. His presence in glory is exemplified in love. I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. Okay? He said he's just going away, but I want them to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me. Why? Because you love me before the creation of the world. Jesus is focusing the attention for the future believers right on that, that word love that we don't know very well. And he's saying that that is a characteristic of his vision for the church. Now, our insight grows out of that love. In verse 25, he says, The righteous Father, though the world does not know me, I know you, and they, that is future believers, know that you have sent me. So our insight and our ability to know God and Jesus Christ grows through that love. And that love being centered means that God's love is in, he says in them, but it's in us. How do we get back to reflecting what Jesus is praying for in this passage? He's praying this for his church. So it's, it's not outside of our reach spiritually. And we will be honoring Jesus Christ if we honor the prayer that he offered to God. And so as we conclude the passage, you've got to ask yourself, how then can my prayer life be different? All right? First of all, and we've already covered it, change your focus. Understand the plan of God in your life and in everyone's life and realize that you need to change your focus. Your focus has to stay on God's glory. Not what I've got planned for six months from now. And let me tell you, I'm a planner. My life is more enjoyable when I got something down the road to plan. All right? When I get restless because I got no big event coming up and I don't know what to do with myself. But what I need to focus on is God's glory. How can God be glorified in what I am doing? We need to understand as well when we pray that, that our others, that is friends, are an important part of God's glory. In other words, you all are as much a part of God's glory as I am. So when I pray and I'm thinking about how do I bring glory to God, i got to remember to pray for you guys because you guys are as much a part of God's glory as I am. And the together that we have, it just multiplies God's glory. That's why if a church can get serious about unity and about accepting and loving one another, I don't think you need to worry about all the details. You know, let's boil it down right into the essentials.
devolve back around to God and allowing God to handle the future. I want to handle the future. God says, "Uh uh-uh. You take care of you now in relation to me, and I will take care of the future. When we understand that truth, the things that Jesus prayed about, that our joy would be full, that we would be one, that love would be the characteristic of a body of believers will begin to happen. And when you guys realize that and change your prayer life to reflect God's standards, there's no limit to what God might do. We'll be adding chairs. Let's pray. Father, as you have given us an opportunity now to look at your word, to understand once again how significantly important a realization of Jesus' love for us and the fact that he would pray for us a thousand, two thousand years down the road, that he cared about me, that he wanted me to experience the things his disciples were experiencing, and that he promised certain results, Lord, and I don't often see those results. I'm humbled, and I'm convicted by the need to reorient my spiritual focus and pray the way you prayed. Father, help us each to remember that thing and to honor you this week. In Jesus' name, amen.